So um, since the intros and everything happened yesterday without wasting too much of your time, I think uh, we can get ready and get started right away. So all okay. yours, Misha. Okay. Um, apologies, I'm still drinking coffee because it's early. <laughs> that is true. It's quite early there. Can you see the title slide? Yes, can see it. Okay, so uh, today I'd like to uh, give the second lecture, going deeper into the biology um, of things we've done in the lab. So uh, that's kind of summarized in neuron glia computation for behavioral states and navigation. Um, and again, a picture of the fish um, at one year, uh, at one week of age, um, and I'm including this because uh, um, to show you that you cannot just see the brain, but also many other parts of the body that we're we're actually very interested in. Um, this is uh, this part of the fish that you can see is about 1.8 millimeters long, um, and I wanted to show you that in relation to uh, I think it's called a dime or nickel. A ni uh, a nickel, like a 10 cent coin. I think it's the smallest coin uh, that uh, exists in the US uh, and often used as a scale bar um, when, when, when showing off the smallness of objects. And trying that here didn't really work because this is like the R on the, I think it's the R in, in the word liberty on the nickel. So uh, I hope that gives you an impression of how, how small uh, this, this animal is um, making it quite useful for, uh, for what we're doing. Um, I'm getting a weird zoom and a, and a pop up message. Okay. Um, so uh, we're interested in, uh, in systems neuroscience and how, uh, how the brain transforms inputs to outputs. Uh, loops inside the brain and loops between the brain and the environment. Um, but we're also interested in how uh, body-wide networks um, can do that. It goes to the next slide. Um, how the brain communicates with other parts of the body to perform information processing um, in larger networks. Um, and uh, the advantage of having a small preparation is that the difference in size between um, a cell and the entire system is not as many orders of magnitude as it is in a larger animal. So uh, we can look across scales and we can look at the system and its completeness. Um, and I'm going to tell you two, uh, two studies about different cell types in the brain. And again, um, this is all in collaboration with many people. Uh, and this first part is a uh, work by N. Young, together with Martin Svart, Si Cheng Wei, Benjamin James, Mikhail Rubinov, Sujata Narayan, and James Fitzgerald, who is uh, also a group leader at Jamelia. Um, and this study concerns the behavior that uh, zebrafish show and many fish show, where uh, they have to deal with flowing environments. Um, unlike us, we are anchored to the ground with our legs. Uh, fish and birds and flying insects are often in situations where they have to deal with flow in their environment that if they wouldn't address, uh, would sweep them to unknown areas. Um, and you could imagine sort of the worst case of these, if, uh, if a body of water is draining and the animals wouldn't do anything about it, they would end up in, on dry land and suffocate. So, uh, so this is what they do, I think. Everyone, everyone knows that fish often swim against the flow. Um, and often uh, this, this behavior is called rheotexis and the, the purely visual component of this is called the optimotor response where animals see the detect, detect the direction of motion and swim in that direction. Um, one second. Um, just to make sure I fully wake up. Um, and uh, it's often described as kind of on, on that shorter time scale. Um, but it's also possible that it's actually something that unfolds on much longer time scales where 
animals have an active uh, representation of where they are in space. And there are, uh, uh, there's, there's, there are studies from uh, Florian Engert's group and Ruben Portuguese group where they've seen long time scale responses to uh, sideways moving dots that they interpreted in the context of decision making as an animal decides to move left or right, to turn left or right. So um, we asked the question, uh, is this more um, a pre reflex like behavior or do the brains of, uh, of these animals actually have some kind of repre explicit representation of where they are in space um, and how much they've moved um, over the past uh, much longer period. So uh, the question is, um, do animals minimize their displacement in space? And, and, and we like to think of it in algorithmic terms or engineering terms before we dive into the biology. Um, so do they minimize their displacement in space simply by uh, the water flow uh, causing the fish to, to move? They detect this, the velocity, their, their self velocity through, uh, for example, their visual system, but also their vestibular and uh, kind of sensory system uh, plays a part and then swim in response to that. And then swimming changes the velocity of the fish. So, so with this simple feed forward scheme, you could kind of uh, perform this behavior. And that's the question, is this all they do or do they have a more explicit idea of, of how much they've moved recently? And so we use the virtual reality system um, that I explained yesterday to investigate this. Um, and I'm going to show you a behavioral assay that we expose the fish to. Um, but I'm going to show you it in virtual space. So remember the fish is uh, immobilized. And, um, and so when you see here, the fish move forward, what's actually happening is the fish is immobilized under the microscope and the visual picture underneath the fish is moving backward and so on. So the fish is an environment like that. Uh, it has a lot of uh, edges that will tell the visual system of the fish if it's moving or not and where it's moving to, but it has no explicit landmarks. There are no recognizable objects. And that's why, that's because we wanted to isolate the, the flow component um, of the environment or of the fish moving through the environment. Um, and uh, this, this dashed line is just for our reference. Um, and so we also don't have real water flow in these virtual environments, but we can simulate it uh, by visual flow in the opposite direction. So if we want to simulate backward water flow, we show visual motion in the forward direction to the fish. Um, and so imagine we switch on the virtual water flow. The fish moves backward, swims forward, like you just saw in the movie, in the adult fish. Those were not zebra fish, but uh, um, they, 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 they don't exist near us. They might exist near you, but not, not here. But uh, it's just a universal behavior. So I use those as an example. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, this is uh, the basic optomotor response. Um, and if it's kind of well-tuned, you know, if the, if the amount of forward swimming is kind of the right amount, then um, the fish might roughly stabilize its location in space. Um, and so we asked, uh, what it, does this, the fish actually have a memory of its, uh, of its uh, locational change over the last much longer time period or not? So imagine that the fish has no memory location. Uh, since it's behaving in virtual reality, we can actually artificially move the fish somewhere else by just moving the, the, the image underneath the fish. For example, this would happen if there's a, a short uh, gust of water flow that's maybe too short to make, that, make the fish swim because fish usually take a second or so before they even start swimming uh, in response to flow. So imagine uh, it's this feed forward system without memory and the fish kind of just reflex like uh, responds, um, maybe a short integrator on the time scale of one second that kind of delays the onset of swimming by a second. But other than that, the, the fish has no idea of where it is in space. If we now, several seconds later, switch on the word virtual water flow, uh, the fish would perform the behavior that you just saw, but it would perform it elsewhere in space and end up in a forward, uh, forward location. Um, if the fish does have location memory, then its brain would register that it's been moved through space. And uh, even if we wait for multiple seconds, then switch on the flow, its behavior should take that into account. For example, it might wait longer before it actually starts swimming. 
Um, and conversely, if the fish have lo location memory, then we should be able to move it backward. And um, again, the fish should then take that into account when several seconds later the flow comes on, uh, maybe the fish will swim a little harder. So the sort of question, does the fish swim weaker or wait longer or swim harder and react faster, uh, can tell us, if we study that over multiple trials, can tell us whether fish have um, a no memory or a perfect location memory or something in between. And uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll divide the time axis into two periods. One is the displace period. The other one is the swim period. Um, the displace period is a passive displacement. Swim period is the a uh, period of time where the animal can decide on its own location by balancing the amount of backward flow and the amount of forward swimming or the vigor of forward swimming. Um, and so the question is, do they get back to their original location? And um, we and we can use the average of these trajectories to answer that. Now there's even there's usually some locational drift. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, we can see your cursor. Cool. So, so if you don't displace the fish, this middle trajectory, um, there's usually some drift. The fish will move move forward a little bit or backward a little bit, presumably because uh, they're they're uh, when you have an integrator uh, or when you have any kind of control system, um, the uh, 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 there are small imperfections. Uh, so. Um, you can see, I, I'll, I'll just come to I'll come to this in the coming slide. So it turns out that zebrafish can swim back to an earlier memorized location uh, very well. So here's an example fish, and these dashed lines here uh, are the trajectories of the fish if it would not swim at all. So it would simply be passively displaced forward in magenta, backward in green, or not displaced in blue. And then during the swim period, it would just be passively dragged backwards. Um, all right, so these are the post displacement period and the swim period. Um, and this is what actually happens. Uh, so this is the average over one fish. And uh, just now I refer to the fact that uh, there's, there's usually some uh, drift, even when the fish hasn't been displaced. So if you look at the blue curve, you can see it's going up a little bit over time. Um, that also happens to the green and the magenta curve. That means the fish swims forward a little bit, it overshoots a bit. Um, and, and this, this is a uh, locational drift that you can also see uh, in other animals uh, and in integrating systems in general um, over time. So uh, there, there are two questions. I'm, should I, oh, oh, I see. The first was Vatsala, the second. OK, I'll, I'll wait until Vatsala, um, you interrupt me. Should I read out the question now, uh, Misha? I think sure. this yeah. is about the VR environment. So now uh -huh. is a good time to answer it. In VR environments, does the visual input provide completely provided completely capture the sensory feedback a fish would have in a water body through vision, mechanoreceptor feedback, etc., in terms of behavioral response? Or are the responses good enough approximates of what they would be otherwise when other inputs are present too? Um, it's uh, the second. They're, they're good enough. Um, I often compare to the, the mouse on the ball experiments where the head, where the head is fixed. That means the vestibular input is uh, mostly gone. Um, also, the way that the mouse can, you know, walks on the ball is not completely the same as a mouse would walk in an environment. They actually have to learn to do that. Um, so it's the same for the fish. Their vestibular input is gone. Their mechanosensory input is gone. Proper receptive input is gone. But we find remarkably uh, that, that their behaviors are remarkably naturalistic and rich um, just based on visual input. And uh, my interpretation is that the that visual input provides a lot of information to these animals. And uh, I did an experiment uh, as a postdoc with a friend, uh, Pablo Oteiza, who, who focuses on, on, on real taxes. Um, and um, what he did, uh, and and I, I was there with him, uh, is a show a visual stimulus that moved in one direction and a water flow that moved in the other direction. So they were mismatched and they followed the, the visual flow. And I think that's because the visual flow uh, has, has more accurate information about the location of the animal when it is available. Um, 
in the dark, the fish would go by the uh, by the cues from water flow, which is uh, is the local curl, for example, um, that is detected by uh, mechanosensory hair cells along the tail and outside of the animal. So, um, so they they do use both, but somehow vision seems to dominate um, when they have it when they when they need to choose, and I think that's why using these visual VR environments uh, works so well. Okay, now this is data across eight fish. Um, and, um, and here is uh, uh, the, this is normalized to the, uh, to the blue um, to subtract out this very slow drift, which is sometimes forward, sometimes backward in different fish. Uh, and you can see that they bring together the trajectories um, that means that they correct if they've moved forward in the in the past, they swim a little less so that relative to the blue case to the middle case they move backward and when they've been. Uh, uh, moved backward in VR they swim a little more or more vigorously uh, and, and they move forward relative to the middle trajectory. Um, and the way they do that that is they modulate multiple aspects of their behavior, they swim harder, uh, they swim earlier. Um, they swim more often. You can see that there's a five second gap between the displacement. Um, uh, and so their, their memory uh, lasts more than five seconds. And they take actually about 10 seconds to make these trajectories converge. Uh, and at the end of the 10 seconds, you see it's still converging. That means that this memory of past displacement lasts at least 15 seconds. And uh, on average, they're, I would say they're almost perfect um, within these 15 seconds. Uh, so we were very surprised by this. We thought, uh, I mean, I, I think this is also something that happened to the Drosophila field where fruit flies were assumed to be a bit stupid, not do very much, be kind of reflex machines. But as people study them more and more, they find that their behavior is very rich. Um, and I think the same thing is happening to zebrafish. Okay, uh, so- Misha, <laughs> so the uh, Srivas who, who posted the previous question has a follow-up question. Does that imply that proprioceptive and other forms of mechanosensory inputs may not be as important in terms of spatial memory, etc., in these organisms? I think it does, um, but I don't want to rule out um, that if the others are available, that they will become very important. Um, and certainly, if vision is not is not available, the others might become very important. Um, and uh, I think it would be interesting actually to study whether. Uh, for example, mechanical sensation or vestibular sensation uh, will also lead to spatial memories and whether that's mediated by the same system or, or perhaps a different system, circuit. Okay, so uh, this was kind of a simple forward or backward movement of the fish. Uh, we found that we can also um, uh, do it differently. So Anne ran an experiment where she pushed the fish forward over different time periods and over different uh, uh, different uh, displacements um, and found that they, they, they still do this uh, here. If you compare the initial to the final position, uh, you can see that uh, across fish, um, they're pretty accurate once again. Um, so they integrate over, over space and over time. Um, and these deviations that you see in the last one where it's, it doesn't go to zero, that's when the fish actually tries to turn because if you move the fish forward too much they want to turn so that they can swim backward um, so uh, I mean I, I've, to me this is remarkable that they're so good at this uh, you can even do it with uh, randomized trajectories that end up in different locations in space and when you make it even harder for the fish uh, for example you give them two periods in which to get back or not um, they also do it. So uh, they're in between the swim periods, they're again clamped in space, in virtual space. Um, you can compare initial to middle and final time points to see that uh, over these two swim periods, they make the trajectories converge. Um, and this is now, uh, I, I forget the exact uh, time, but I think it's about 25 seconds after the initial displacement. Um, Keep in mind that they're integrating where they are in space during periods when they're not swimming um, and during periods where they are swimming. Um, and these are potentially different computations um, because when they're not swimming, they, they need to watch the environment. 
move and when they are swimming they need to watch the environment move and also watch the environment move in response to their own swimming uh i i accidentally saw the question so uh maybe i missed it but the motivation for the fish to return to its original location what is that um that's a great question um and the way we think about it is that uh, we're looping these trials. So for example, here at the end of this yellow period starts, uh, you know, after some, uh, after a few seconds of, uh, uh, of, of uh, clamping the fish in space, that's when the um, movement starts again, the passive movement starts. Um, that means that at the start of this, of this time axis, the fish were able to uh, choose their own location um, and again, I'm anthropomorphizing, um, but the fish is in control of its own location during these yellow periods. So when the next uh, uh, when the next cyan period starts, when the next forced displacement starts, they're in a location uh, that they were able to control. And there, uh, we have other studies. Um, one uh, by Takashi Kawashima in 2016, and the other one by Yumu in 2019. That I'll present later. The, the second study I'll present later that suggests that there uh, there's some uh, positive valence associated with being in control of your own location, and some negative valence associated with being forced uh, to another location um, that's not under your control. And so I think just having having control over where the fish is in space, um, uh, followed by being moved passively to another location in space um, is for the organism a, a good reason to go back to where it was before. I hope that makes sense. I think that's that's true for us as well uh, in general. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, it's true for us. I think that there's a positive valence associated with being in control um, of, of uh, of, of your situation and a negative valence uh, with uh, losing control. Okay, so we used uh, whole brain recordings, as you saw yesterday during the Misha, figure. there's another question, follow-up question mm -hmm. from Vishruta. I'm sure that not all fish are motivated to do the same, are they? Is it the same like that of ants? I don't know what the comparison. Yeah, the homing, homing behavior of ants. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the homing be behavior of ants is, uh, I can, this is one thing that, that, uh, I can, uh, can I annotate, um, should be able to annotate somehow, uh, okay, I can animate it with my, with my, uh, mouse. So suppose that, uh, this computer screen is the home, the, the, the nest of an ant, desert ant, they can forage, so they can they can search through the environment like this through fairly complex trajectories, um, and then when they're done foraging for food, they can return back to their nest in almost a straight line. So uh, they must be integrating their small movements through space, um, adding up all these little displacements on their way out into a global displacement vector, and then invert that behaviorally to get back to their nest quite efficiently. Um, so. Uh, I think uh, in that sense, I consider it uh, very analogous to that. Of course, in one dimension, we haven't done this yet in two dimensions, but that's the plan. Um, so uh, so uh, I think the analogy to ants is accurate, um, uh, but uh, in a different situation and probably on shorter timescales, I mean, ants, they, they take ages compared to the timescale of this behavior. Um, although we haven't fully characterized the timescale, eventually it'll peter out. Um, and whether all fish perform the same, um, from all the data I've seen, uh, they, they pretty much all do this, but the amount of drift um, during the, the no displacement trial, the, the amount of drift over time uh, varies. So some, um, uh, while they're swimming against the flow, some will stabilize it quite well, others will overshoot a bit, others will undershoot a bit, um, and that varies per fish. But the, um, but the integration of the past movement, so the convergence of these trajectories, of these average trajectories, meaning they have integrated past movements, uh, seems to be very consistent across fish. Of course, there'll be outliers, right? There are always fish that do things differently. 
So this uh, one more question, Sanket asks, would such results hold if these experiments are carried out in the 360 degree space rather than just forward and backward? Uh, so I think so. We saw uh, uh, in the in the neural responses that I'll show you later. We saw also responses to sideways motion, um, but um, but we haven't uh, checked behaviorally yet. This is something that's uh, on our to do list. All right. So we did whole brain imaging in search of cells that uh, represent the fish location, um, and so uh, as I said before the. Yesterday, the analysis of these data is kind of a non-trivial task, um, and we create we and others create infrastructure to do that, both uh, computational and on the uh, on on the implementation side, um, using compute clusters. Um, and so we can ask now, uh, what happens if we search for strong correlations between the location of the fish and neuronal activity in the brain? And this this gives us a brain map. Um, this is seven fish combined, so we used statistical methods to uh, find uh, cells in, the, in these brains that were uh, uh, significantly represented also in other fish. So every, every, uh, every hit you see in this map uh, means that uh, there's, a, there's a cell here in one of the brains, um, but there's a statistically significant uh, 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 probability that there is a cell uh, very near that location in all of the other brains as well. So this is a, a statistical consensus map of position encoding cells. Now, you also saw that uh, depending on uh, the past displacement of the fish, the future behavior uh, can be changed. Um, and so uh, this, is, this, this is not necessarily just a kind of passive representation. We shouldn't use passive because I already used that word. This is not just a representation of where the fish is in space. It's also part of a sensory motor transformation that transforms that into changes in future behavior. So we also asked, um, are there cells that have a strong correlation between the neuronal activity um, after, the, after the displacement and the distance swam in the future? Um, and so these are behavior predicting cells. Uh, and there's some statistical correlation between uh, between these two criteria, um, but uh, but these are different analyses, and you can see that they highlight largely the same brain regions. Um, and these brain regions include an area that we haven't fully identified yet, so we give it a placeholder name for uh, self-location encoding medulla oblongata neurons, or SLOMO. Um, and one reason we chose this acronym is because behavior is slow. Um, sorry, uh, the neural activity is slow. Uh, so you saw that there are long time constants in the behavior, right? 25 seconds after the displacement, they're still kind of memorizing that. Um, and this is also, an, uh, slow-mo is the uh, area in the brain where we found the longest time constants in neural activity. Um, then also the inferior olive, the cerebellum, the dorsal raphid nucleus, and in one of them, the habenula. So we focused on uh, uh, three regions that we uh, hypothesized are connected, um, but I can also tell you about the others. Okay, so uh, as a first um, investigation of uh, how these, what these areas might be doing, we asked whether these areas are better at storing the memory of past displacement or whether they're better at uh, predicting future behavior. Um, by simply counting the cells that were significantly involved in one or the other. We found that um, in area slow-mo, uh, there were um, uh, relatively more cells uh, that were significantly encoding the memory, um, but there were also cells that, that could predict future behavior. Um, then in the inferior olive and the cerebellum, um, it, the balance was kind of shifted towards uh, prediction rather than memory. Um, and in the, the dorsal raphid nucleus, there were some of both, and the optic tectum here is included as a region um, for comparison where we, we didn't find significant cells. Um, and also uh, here you can see that you know, under this analysis, uh, it also doesn't produce significant numbers. Um, and so given this, uh, we, we, we hypothesize that there might be an information flow uh, from slow-mo to the inferior olive, and the inferior olive is known to project to the cerebellum. Um, 
So uh, we checked uh, anatomically and functionally whether there is connectivity from slow-mo to inferior olive. We did that by tracing neurites from slow-mo cells um, and, uh, and found that they project to the inferior olive area where there are dendrites. Um, we also did optogenetics. We excited slow-mo cells and found that it, this transiently suppresses activity in the inferior olive. There's um, a question, Nisha. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this context, uh, how is memory encoding studied through neural activity? Yeah, I'll show you that uh, in the next slide. Um, and so this is the circuit we hypothesized where, uh, where there's a functional information flow from slow-mo to inferior olive to the cerebellum, um, which you probably all know, uh, larval zebrafish have a cerebellum uh, and uh, uh, consisting of Purkinje cells with uridendroid cells as the output cells. So the uridendroid cells take the place of the deep cerebellar nuclei. Um, so um, uh, now we were interested in studying this circuit, but also looking at the representations uh, of, of uh, location in these areas. Um, to address the question. Um, so here's slow-mo in one, um, uh, in, in one uh, example animal, and these cells are color-coded for activity that increases depending on whether the animal moves forward or backward through virtual space. Um, and so here's an example cell whose activity increases when the animal moves forward, and then here's an example cell whose activity increases when the animal moves backward. But they both of their activity depends on whether the animal moves forward or backward. Uh, and the black here, the black line is when the animal doesn't move. Um, you can see that activity across these trials converges as the trajectories converge. So this is schematic behavior, but this is a roughly representative of, uh, of uh, fish behavior in general, as you saw before. So uh, these, okay, these cells encode the location of the animal, but in a non-trivial way. Um, the cell here at the bottom is, is fairly pure in that uh, activity doesn't wander too much if the fish doesn't move. It increases when the fish moves backward, decreases when the fish moves forward. But cell one actually also has a ramp, um, even when the fish doesn't move. And this ramp is triggered by the cessation of swimming on the previous trial. So back here where my cursor is now, the fish is still swimming. It then stops swimming, and that's kind of when it starts ramping. So it's a non-trivial encoding. Um, but across a population, uh, the, the ranked correlation between uh, the fish location and cell activity is uh, consistently uh, fairly high across the entire trial. Um, you can also visualize this in a network space where I use dimensionality reduction, as I also uh, talked about yesterday, and you're already familiar with this, um, to, to visualize the activity of the entire uh, slow-mo, these are several hundred cells. Um, this is, uh, so the start of the trial is here, at the yellow star. This hold period where the fish doesn't move um, is uh, shown in, in, this, in these dashed lines. Um, these dis forced displacements, forward or backward or none, uh, are represented by these solid lines. And you can see at this point, uh, the uh, activity trifurcates in network space, just like the trajectories trifurcate in virtual real space. Um, and then they stay separated, um, encoding both the location of the fish and time along this uh, other di direction. Um, and then as the fish swims uh, to correct for its location, the trajectories go down and converge and come back to the starting point. Um, so there's a clear representation of physical space uh, in network space. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, this made us ask if that's clearly visible, you know, to, to us as we look at these uh, three-dimensional plots, can we actually extract it uh, in a simple way as well? So what we did was, um, this is a work with uh, Ben James and James Fitzgerald. Um, can we decode these signals to estimate the location of the fish by taking a snapshot of neural activity at a given moment in time? And we tried a simple linear decoder, uh, which is essentially just uh, a linear weighted sum uh, of neural activity with optimized weight um, to decode. Um, and uh, of course, this is cross-validated data. Uh, here you can see that the, the decoded trials, uh, the decoded location on single trials 
uh, is fairly uh, is a fairly good estimator of the true location. Um, so that was one example fish. This is uh, across animals and across trials. Um, so we can also get that that information out without uh, without having to go to um, uh, complicated models. We can simply use a linear model to 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 read out the location of the fish. Um, so that was all correlational, interpreting the activity. Um, but of course, we're interested to go deeper um, and ask uh, about mechanisms. Um, so one thing we did was to ablate this region, slow-mo, and ask how that affects the behavior that I called positional homeostasis early, the, the balancing of its position in space, which requires path integration. Um, and so we found that you don't actually have to ablate all the cells um, to disable the memory ability of this circuit. In this case, um, I don't know which, which uh, region and ablated, if it's the backward cells or the forward cells, um, but if she does either, um, the remaining cells retain their visual sensitivity, so they, so they still will respond to the displacement, um, but they lose the memory ability, so the persistence in their activity is gone. Um, they just have a sensory response, but after one or two seconds, the, the response has petered out. Um, whereas before ablation, as you saw, um, these responses have very long time scales for you know, 20 seconds or so, uh, longer than 20 seconds. Uh, they, they, they still encode the location of the fish. Um, after ablation, these would converge um, right, uh, right, right after the uh, displacement of the fish. Um, okay, and now we can we can um, uh, we can uh, compare the behavior before ablation is the behavior that you saw before and after ablation they no longer bring these trajectories together so they lose the memory capacity um, and they can't do positional homeostasis anymore um, so this is I think a very good match between uh, our interpretation of a neural system um, by looking at its responses. Um, and uh, in the context of fish behavior, and then a very predictable um, outcome um, if you blade this area. Um, Isha, there's a question, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sanket asks, how do you ensure that slow-mo has no other function for the purpose of ablation? I think what he means is that if, uh, are you affecting anything else by ablating slow-mo? Uh, I, I think, uh, I think we do affect other things. So um, our, we, have, we hypothesized that this area is the homologue of the nucleus proposed hypoglossy in mammals, um, which is known to uh, encode eye position. Um, and so my guess is that, for example, the ocular motor system might also be affected. Um, but, uh, but this, I think, uh, yeah, we haven't, we haven't proved that yet. This is just a hunch based on literature. Um, so uh, we're not claiming that this is the only thing that um, that this area is, is for, um, but uh, I think it, it would require kind of looking across behaviors to see what other uh, what other things are affected by this, um, and I think that's very interesting um, to do, uh, but uh, it, it's a bit of work. Uh, I think in general, the kind of multitasking nature of neural circuits is very interesting. Uh, we're usually, usually looking at them through the lens of one behavior um, or, or one function, um, but uh, biological circuits can, can multitask very well. So I think these, uh, for example, this circuit has long time constants and there are many other things that long time constants are useful for. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if other things are affected too, but, um, but for the implementation of this uh, of this uh, positional memory, um, I think the fact that this is such a clean uh, su such a clean effect uh, is meaningful. Um, now we do, of course, need to keep track of uh, confounding factors. Like if the fish would just not swim anymore or swim a lot less, you could also get this result. Maybe just because you've you've disrupted swim circuitry, full stop. Right? If you would ablate the spinal cord, these trajectories would also not converge. So we need to check that these, these lower level aspects of behavior are still intact, um, and they are. The fish still swim. Uh, they still swim in response to visual motion. It's just that this 
uh, persistence has disappeared. All right. Um, so this is true across fish. Uh, before ablation, the trajectories come together. If you compare the initial to the final positions in after ablation, they don't. Um, and here's a control ablation. These are other cells in the vicinity. You can see actually the some of the behavior changes. They swim a little. Uh, it takes them longer for the trajectories to converge, but the memory is still there. They still come together. Okay. Um, uh, we also did the opposite experiment where we first imaged. This is now with a two-filter microscope. Did analysis on the fly, um, and then activated cells using um, a channel rhodopsin, channel rhodopsin variant. And here. Uh, Again, we stimulate for a few seconds and wait for five seconds and then start the visual flow. Um, and uh, uh, in, in, in a colloquial language, we can basically implant memories um, of past displacement. Uh, if you and, and this all makes sense functionally. If you stimulate cells that encode uh, backward movement of the fish, uh, the fish will swim more and move forward in virtual space. space. If you stimulate cells that encode forward movement, the fish will swim less and move backward in virtual space um, as if they've actually been moved um, for real. Um, yeah, so this is true across fish um, as well. So um, let me check. Yeah. Um, so uh, Finally, if we, uh, if we take this hypothesized circuit seriously, then ablating the inferior olive should have the same effect because that would mean uh, the slow mo region cannot um, talk to downstream circuits, namely the cerebellum and circuits downstream of the cerebellum. So uh, we also ablated the inferior olive and found that the same thing happens. Um, the fish still uh, swims, it still responds to visual input, although the response to visual input is a little bit. Uh, uh, more, um, it looks more kind of uh, uh, diff. If you ablate slow mo, the visual responses are still very predictable across fish. If you ablate the inferior olive, the visual responses become a little more variable across fish. We think that this re reflects the fact that the inferior olive is quite close, it's closer than slow mo to kind of the feed forward, just a, a hard coded visual to motor transformation. Um, but they still swim, and you can see that indeed uh, their ability for positional homeostasis is also gone. Um, this is true across fish. And now, if we come back to kind of the control theory framework, where we have um, uh, water flow leads to fish velocity, leads to swimming, changes fish velocity, this clearly is not enough to describe uh, what's going on. We need a. We now know that the fish integrates velocity over time. And that integrated velocity modulates swimming um, bidirectionally. It can uh, increase or decrease future swimming. We can now assign specific circuits to this. So the slow mo region integrates velocity and communicates that to motor circuits via the inferior olive and the cerebellum. Of course, there are tons of questions left. Um, how, how are they really connected um, at the cell by cell on a cell by cell basis? Um, what are the uh, mechanisms for, uh, for the persistence in area slow-mo um, and many others. So uh, lots of things to still do. Um, now I want to uh, get to the second part. Oh, I see there are many questions. Since I'm transitioning. Yeah, I think I uh, now is a, there are a few questions. So mm -hmm. Bidisha is asking whether the maximum travel distance is constant for a fish and ablation does not affect it? Uh, I think you're probably, um, uh, are you referring to the, uh, to the drift or are you referring to how much the fish swims in, uh, in the swim period? So Bidisha, I've unmuted you. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So um, in the last uh, slide, I think so. I yeah uh, yeah yeah this is fine. Uh, I, I I can see there is some uh, two centimeter um, 
scale is there. So what is the meaning of that thing? And I was um, observing that uh, this this is the, the, the vertical line is for fish position, right? How much it is traveling. So I can yeah, yeah. see that literally where, where it is in virtual constant. space. Oh, yeah, it's it's the fish location. It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so is it always uh, the same for all all the fish, or it, it may be different for other fish also, or um, I just want to uh, understand this 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 is the maximum it, travel it, they can do. I'm trying to. Uh, does anyone know how can annotate somehow? So in uh, do you see view options on top, uh, Misha? Under view options, no, I think, oh, but I but think it's, it's not there. Oh, it's uh, not hang on, there. view for security purpose, we disabled that one. Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, well, well, maybe I can just use my mouse. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you're referring to how much the fish swims in this period. Um, and you're you're asking what is the, the what does this two centimeter scale bar mean? So the two centimeter scale bar is uh, is is conditioned on the screen being one centimeter under the fish. So um, imagine the fish is uh, is say in this yellow box. The screen is here at the bottom of the screen. Um, if this is one centimeter, then then this scale bar means uh, two centimeters moved uh, in screen space. Of course, if the, if you move the fish upward. Um, then moving two centimeters here uh, is perceived as the fish by the fish as as, as much uh, less movement. It's like when you're in a train and you look at trees in the distance, uh, they move much slower than when you look at trees that are really close to you. Um, so there, there's some arbitrariness of this two two centimeter, but the way we calibrate it is the screen is one centimeter under the fish, um, uh, and. So, so the amount that fish swim here, it's not this. It's not the same across fish. I mean, some uh, some fish drift upward, some some fish drift downward a bit. Some some are pretty flat. Um, and here you can also see these are individual uh, fish trajectories in faint lines. They they're not they're not super stereotyped, but what they have in common is that they bring together these trajectories. But some are some are slower at it, some are faster at it. Does that roughly answer your question? Okay, maybe can 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 everyone still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, Bidisha, I I guess they can. Is is that is that yeah. clear? Yeah, yeah, it, it's fine now. So so yeah, uh, the right hand side uh, plot is normalized location, right? Uh, means it is not. Uh, yeah, it's normalized to this scale. blue trajectory. Yeah, but um, the left side plot. Um, in the in the left side plot, uh, it is not normalized, right? No. So here, you, here you can see a bit of drift. Okay. So um, we think this I, is all the this, this is all the same system. It's just that here we engage uh, quite a big, uh, quite a big translation in a yeah. short time span. Um, so so there's probably also drift in the representation of this location, but it's kind of drifting together. And because it's a sudden translation, uh, the, uh, uh, we can simulate it. I haven't done it, but I'm confident that, that you can simulate this if you have an integrator with a, with a bit of drift. That's also the case for ants. They also, uh, they also drift over time. Um, given that, uh, so, so suppose this is um, uh, maybe, um, uh, one centimeter over 15 seconds, or one centimeter over, over 10 seconds, given that this is like two centimeters over one second, even with this drift applied, um, this is still robustly encoded uh, at this point and can be transferred to behavior. Um, uh, even when there's a uh, one centimeter of drift every 15 seconds, uh, I hope that makes sense. So, but, but, but we think that the integration, positional integration that's happening here uh, is, is essentially the same mechanism as, as the positional integration that's happening here. Although we do have evidence that there are differences. There, there, there are cells that are specifically 
um, you know, representing behavior as well. So this area is, is fairly um, multimodal, and this is also uh, something we aim to look at in more detail. Maybe I can go to the other question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There are a Thank few you. more questions. Um, Banupriya asks, which is a question I also have, which is, you mentioned long time constants. How is the long time constant implemented in this circuit? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and we would love to know that. Um, given these ablation results, um, where if you take out half of the population, the persistence in the other half is gone. Uh, for that reason, we think that this is a recurrent circuit where these cells are connected to each other. Um, we also know that uh, almost all of them are GABAergic, so they're inhibitory, um, which is a uh, if you have typical attractor networks, they have a mix of inhibitory and excitatory cells. You can think of the excitatory cells as kind of spreading activation to other cells and inhibitory cells to uh, keep the overall, to keep it from becoming runaway excitation. And by balancing these two forces, you kind of give the, uh, you endow the circuit with the ability to encode multiple levels of activity. Um, for an in inhibitory circuits, uh, you can do something similar if you build them artificially. You can give the cells a non-zero firing rate when they have no input, which is then pushed down by input from their partners um, to uh, to form, for example, a line attractor. Um, there's also a way to build it uh, if you assume a rebound currents so that uh, instantaneous inhibition leads to subsequent excitation. Um, and that way you can also create long-time constants in inhibitory networks um, but uh, we don't know uh, which mechanism is exactly at play here. So we would love to have, for example, connectomic data and also information about the, the kind of channels that are present in these cells. Mm -hmm. So um, Sriram is asking, how would you extend the same mechanism for path integration in 2D? Do you think this mechanism is specific to the automotor response where fish can always turn and orient along the flow direction and not for general exploratory behavior? So my guess is it is also used in general exploratory behavior. And uh, we see the automotor response more as a way to engage this, uh, this system. Um, I'm not, I think the automotor response is cool, but it's definitely not, uh, I mean, it, it's an example behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we're not specifically focused on that, but the ability of the fish to um, to memorize its displacements through space, I think that is that is interesting. And I I, I would be surprised if it's only um, mm -hmm. uh, relevant in the optimal response. I think also for uh, active exploration, they can use it. But that's that's also something we want to still look at. And I also think in two D, as I said, we saw. Uh, responses in slow mode to sideways motion. Um, so I think that's that's that that's probably uh, uh, taking care. That that the reason for that is probably so that they can do this in two D, maybe even three D. So that we don't know. I I can ask a follow up then. So to connect this with the HBO that you talked about yesterday, are there connections from slow mo to HBO to bias fish to turn a certain way to uh, you know come back to where they were that's a great question um and um uh we did see so when we activate slomo we see uh we see activity changes in the anterior hindbrain um and this is this is actually very useful thank you uh <laughs> because we kind of um uh we didn't really know how to interpret that um but uh, but now you mention it. I think this is uh, this is um, uh, we need to check if that's the HBO. But if it okay. is, I think it's probably that. That'll be great. Yeah, we come full circle. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another pun, question. Pun interpreted. Um, it's a, yeah, it's <laughs> Um, Srivas is asking, how long before the behavior do the predictive neurons fire? Um, oh, 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 okay. So the predictive neurons are uh, uh, are the same. It's the same neuron. So, so you can me. 
you can think of them as the same set of neurons. So they they are just persistently firing. Of course, you know the the firing rates are they're not firing rates firing, firing times are are discrete, right? Um, but uh, uh, um, so from from uh, voltage imaging, uh, we found that the, the, these cells can fire between maybe a little over one hertz, but they can go to much higher firing rates uh, that we can't track with calcium indicators. So maybe uh, 30 hertz or so, maybe even more. Um, so they're, they're continuously firing. Um, and so uh, we think that they, they, they bias motor circuits. Um, so they don't necessarily, so, so when I say predictive cells, what we, what we do is we take a snapshot um, uh, as the flow switches on, but they take about a second to swim. So this cartoon is a little wrong. Uh, this uh, convergence should start just after the dashed line. Um, and so we take a snapshot just after the dashed line before they swim. And then we relate that to future swimming. Mm -hmm. Banupriya is asking, why is there a lag of five seconds before the movement is initiated? Uh, is this time period typically constant? Yeah, during that period, um, so uh, the, uh, oh, I forgot I can't annotate. So, okay, if this motion, uh, if the curse is the fish moving through virtual space, uh, uh, it's still for two seconds, then over a period of one second, we'd say we move it forward or backward. Suppose we move the fish forward. Um, and we, we kind of, we don't make this, too vigorous or too long. So the fish tends not to respond immediately. Then the fish is, um, stays, in, stays in place for five seconds. We've also done other periods. Um, and when it doesn't see any motion, it can, do, it can swim spontaneously, but on average, it won't swim too much. Um, and if there's a fish that just swims all the time, we typically don't use it because we can't study, we can't use it very well to study memory. Um, so suppose the fish doesn't swim. If the fish does swim, um, then uh, the fish is actually stuck in space. Um, and uh, if the, again, if the fish swims too much, they can go into other behavioral states that I might get to um, in the second part of the talk if there's time. Um, so we don't want the fish to swim too much and then give up um, when, they, when they find, it's a behavior that we see if fish swim a lot and they don't move, they tend to stop swimming. It's like they're giving up. So. Um, we, we don't use those kind of trials either. Um, and then uh, after these five seconds, uh, we simulate backward flow. So the fish moves backward if it doesn't swim. And if the fish does swim, it moves backward, move backward and then moves forward as well um, when it swims. Um, so during these five seconds, we just kind of clamp the fish in space, but generally the fish is sort of cool with that. Um, and we use that because we want to uh, test the persistence of this uh, information, right? We want to see that it persists for at least five seconds. Um, yeah. I think that's about the questions for now. Uh, so, you know, I think you may go to the next part and then we'll take questions at the end again if we have time. But right. keep posting so your questions on the chat box, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, here I put this other header. So we, we consider these uh, kind of control systems uh, that, uh, that bring the fish closer to a goal. And previously uh, we could interpret this as the fish um, working to minimize its displacement in space. Um, but uh, uh, we should also remember that this is an animal which has a um, metabolism and doesn't have infinite energy stores. Um, so, one, one factor that will enter into this computation is the need to um, minimize energy expenditure, um, at least uh, keep it below infinite memory expen energy expenditure. Um, and that brings me to the second part, um, which was headed by Yumu, Davis Bennett, Mikhail Rubinov, and Sujata Narayan. Um, Yumu now has his own lab, Davis is a, in scientific computing, Mika has his own lab and Sujata is still here, but she's going to move as well later in the year. Um, so uh, just to uh, tell you a little more about, about them. Um, 
so and the idea is that sometimes when animals try to achieve a goal uh, they might uh, spend infinite energy on achieving it um, if it's if it's impossible to reach uh, and i think it's easy to if you make a uh, an ai robot that is uh, kind of um, uh, not not complex enough i think you could run into such situations where it just drains its battery um, but uh, it also um, it's also the case that uh, it can make animals more visible to predators and also more prone to injury. Um, for example, uh, if they're stuck and they can't get out, uh, if they would just keep struggling, they could hurt themselves. Um, and so it's important for the nervous system to uh, interrupt such behavior. Um, and that's what animals do. For example, this squirrel. Uh, squirrel's brain figured out that there's no way it can get to the food. It would need infinite energy, infinite time to get there. And so it's better just to give up. Um, and the, it's not like the animal becomes lethargic. Uh, it's still looking around. Um, it just, it's just quitting that behavior. So in larval zebrafish, we implemented it as follows. And again, this is represented in virtual space. The fish is performing positional homeostasis, as you saw, saw, saw before. But now what happens if we go to open loop and we make, the, make it impossible for the animal to move? So now it's, its actions become futile. Um, and it's analogous to the, um, to the squirrel not being able to climb up the pole. Um, it turns out that fish also give up. So they just stop swimming for a while, about 20 seconds. Uh, this is this is stochastic. It varies per animal, but on average, about twenty seconds of passivity. After which they will try again. Um, and if they are still in an open loop environment, uh, they will uh, they will struggle for about twenty seconds, or they'll try really hard for twenty seconds, and then they'll stop again. Um, and so in VR, it looks like that. This is closed loop swimming with velocity feedback. Um, this is. Uh, open loop swimming without velocity feedback. Um, here you, you can see an example fish. Uh, in closed loop, it swims about once per second. Um, in open loop, it swims a little more haphazard. It tries to turn and then it stops. Um, and that's what we call futility induced passivity or giving up. This transition from an active to a passive state. Um, and here you, you see what happens in open loop. The fish switches back and forth between active and passive. So if it's trying, giving up, trying, giving up. Um, and you can see long time scales, right? About 20 seconds per period, but it varies per period. And so the ethological interpretation is that this, this happens when the fish is stuck, maybe in plants or sand or so, uh, or maybe in the mouth of a predator, or maybe when the temperature drops so much that its muscles become ineffective, or when the fish is injured, maybe it has a, um, a spinal cord injury and the tail just doesn't respond anymore. Okay, so uh, algorithmically, normally motor output leads to visual feedback. Um, and if this is no, no longer true, uh, this mismatch between movement and expected movement must be detected by the brain, integrated over time. Um, you saw it takes the animal about 20 seconds to give up. Um, and then that must lead to a behavioral switch that inhibits future motor output for a while. So we asked, um, how does the brain first detect that behavior is futile? And how does it integrate this and switch the animal into a different behavioral state? Um, and here's data that you saw before here. This is a uh, behavior represented by these vertical deflections of the electro rectified e electrophysiology. And again, referring to yesterday, uh, this is an impoverished representation of behavior. In fact, it, it occurs in two dimensions. Um, but, uh, but you'll see, you'll, you'll simply see this represented as swimming or not swimming. Um, this is sped up by a factor of seven. And this is the neuronal channel. So if you look at average neuronal activity, you can see it, uh, it's strongly modulated by whether the animal is swimming or not. And some of these are feed forward, some of these are feedback connections, some of these are uh, uh, loops within the brain we don't know right now the other i guess the other information is you can see also a lot of activity when the animal is not swimming um, it, it might not be purely spontaneous because the fish is seeing a stimulus um, but there definitely uh, there's definitely activity um, that's um, uh, 
that's spontaneous in the sense that the stimulus velocity is not changing and the animal is not swimming. Um, also to refer to yesterday's question, that's especially strong here in the forebrain. Um, you can see these kind of bubbling activity. And that's, I think, interesting because that's the region where the neocortex um, evolved from. Okay, so we wanted to know this whole kind of algorithm, how this algorithm is implemented. And the first thing that the animal notices is that um, actions are futile. And if you imagine a kind of futility integrator or a futility detector, um, as the animal struggles, struggles harder, uh, this signal might increase over time as the animal gets closer and closer to the behavioral switch. And if we search for, uh, we fit an exponential function to average neural activity, um, and these are the exponents uh, of the, uh, of the, um, and, the, and the coefficients of the, um, no, these are the exponents. So this, this tells you how fast the animal, how fast activity is ramping up as the animal nears the time of the behavioral switch. Um, you can see that, uh, so this is a, a computational brain map. It's the result of an analysis, very similar to what we did for the space encoding cells. And again, these form a specific pattern in the brain, which we found uh, overlaps very strongly with um, an anatomical map of um, noradrenergic neurons. Um, and two major re noradrenergic regions in the brain of fish uh, consist of the locus ceruleus and an area uh, that uh, we think is the uh, homologue of area A2 in mammals. It's kind of less studied than locus ceruleus. In mammals, it has fewer cells, but in fish, it has more cells. And we called NEMO for noradrenergic cluster of the medulla oblongata. Um, so that's that, you know, that's the, that's the official name, but we uh, abbreviate it to NEMO. Uh, and we don't call it A2 yet because we need, we're not. 100% confident yet that this is the homologue of A2. Okay, so uh, given these results, uh, we thought we wanted to start doing causal experiments and, and find out whether uh, they're just correlating to the behavior or actively involved. So we ablated LC or NEMO, and we found that uh, if you ablate LC, sorry, if you ablate NEMO, then you can, uh, then a fish that used to switch between active and passive states is now mostly stuck in the active state. Um, and as you'll see later, uh, this is because the brain doesn't register anymore that the actions are futile. You can compare that to ablations of the locus ceruleus where we don't have a big change in the amount of time the animal is passive. And also the dorsal rafa nucleus as a control region, there's a small change, but it's not significant. But when you ablate Nemo, the cells become much less passive and much more active. And this is not because they're hyperactive, they swim about the same, um, but, they, but they, don't, they just don't stop swimming in the face of futility anymore. You can also do the opposite, activate them using optogenetics, and then you can introduce periods of behavioral quiescence or swim quiescence. Um, in these passive periods, they actually move their eyes more than in the active periods. So it's more of a behavioral switch than lethargy. They just do different things and they don't swim. So, uh, so Nemo is necessary and sufficient for passivity. Um, we can look more closely at how Nemo is encoding visual feedback at every swim bout. So look at much faster time scales. Um, when they're, so we, we did a, an assay where sometimes fish receive visual feedback and sometimes they don't. And sometimes they have kind of opposite feedback, as if they're moving backward when they're trying to swim forward. And um, we found that Nemo responses um, encode the futility of swimming. So when there's no feedback, these cells respond. And when there's kind of worse feedback than expected, they respond even more. So this is real data, but it's shown kind of in cartoon form. Uh, we quantified it in, in much more detail. Um, I can, uh, if anyone is interested, I can send you those data as well. But we were now, after having localized the mismatch detection to area Nemo, we were wondering uh, how this is integrated over time. Um, and so, uh, inspired by uh, studies from other labs in Drosophila and mammals, um, 
we wanted to look at uh, glial cells, specifically astrocytes, that were shown in these other systems to, um, to respond quite strongly to uh, norepinephrine. Um, norepinephrine is the same as uh, noradrenaline, so, uh, so NEMO cells release norepinephrine. Um, these are uh, radial astrocytes in the zebrafish brain. In green, we made a transgenic. We made a series of transgenics um, to label them. And so the, here, they're labeled both in cal with calcium indicators, but of different colors. So we can we can image activity in both cell types. Um, and here, this, it labels all the radial astrocytes, but you can dye fill single cells to visualize their morphology. So. Uh, their, their cell body is in the near the midline of, in the hindbrain. They have this radial projection outward, and here at the edge, they look very uh, much like mammalian astrocytes with these very fine scale structures that uh, intertwine with neural pill and, and synapses and cell bodies. Um, so we call them radial astrocytes because they have an astrocyte like part and a radial glial like part. Um, but we think genetically they're, uh, they're, they, they, they have components of both. Um, and here now you can see the, that same experiment, but now showing uh, both the neuronal and the radial astrocyte channel. And as you saw yesterday, both cell types are very strongly modulated during this behavior. Uh, so neurons are on average more active in the active state, and radial astrocytes are on average more active in the passive state. But um, importantly, uh, activity in, or calcium levels in astrocytes starts rising before the animal switches to a different state. Um, so uh, you can see uh, as an animal goes from a closed loop to an open loop environment, first NEMO signals in cyan, and then astrocytes start increasing their activity. Then the fish switches to a passive state, and then astrocyte activity decays. And NEMO, NEMO activity can start going down before the, the fish switches to a passive state. Um, also, astrocytes only start integrating after about four seconds. Um, we think that this might be because we're imaging uh, calcium. Maybe some other molecule in astrocytes is, is doing the initial integration, but it could also be at the receptor level, some competition between different noradrenergic receptors. But this is all consistent with uh, an integrative process where NEMO detects behavioral futility, astrocytes integrates behavioral futility over time. And when this passes some critical value, uh, it induces shifts in the behavioral state of the animal. So here again, just for fun, this is now sped up seven times. You can see these two cell types. Um, and radar astrocyte activity can be very brain-wide, as you can see here. Um, but uh, this changes over time. So if the fish remains in, in open loop for many minutes, uh, the fish will switch between active and passive states. Um, but uh, um, the activity becomes more localized to a specific brain region. And that's shown here. Um, these are brain regions which are statistically consistently elevated in the passive behavioral state over many repetitions. You can see that when you, in the movie, you saw brain activity as the animal went from a closed loop environment to an open loop environment. The, the first time uh, the brain responds, the astrocytes across the brain respond very vigorously. And, but over time, this becomes more localized to an area that we call ELMO for lateral medulla oblongata, um, which is cons consistently activated they're both neurons in this area and radial astrocytes in this area, which are activated in the passive state. And we think that they interact very tightly. Um, you can see that here, um, this, this is radial astrocyte activity in the ELMO. And you can see these peaks in the open loop period that respond, that correspond to passivity onset. If you zoom into one of them, you can see this integrative period here um, where where signals are consistent with the integration of behavioral futility, and then a persistent activity, persistent signal in the passive state, which is consistent with um, a persistent drive to dampen motor output. But this was kind of a far out hypothesis at the time, um, because astrocytes were hypothesized to be involved in 
information processing, kind of actively in, uh, involved in information processing and computation, but it wasn't really known if this was true. So we took this with a grain of salt and really tested it aggressively by doing all kinds of manipulation experiments, which included uh, three, three, way, three different ways to increase calcium levels in radioastrocytes using chemogenetics or optogenetics. Um, and increasing activity in radioastrocytes all led to an increase in passivity in closed loop environments where animals would not normally become passive and decreasing uh, either the number of astrocytes or um, calcium intracellular calcium signaling in astrocytes all, uh, all decreased passivity in an open loop environment where animals would normally become passive. Um, I'll show you two of these experiments. Um, so if we ablate radial exercise that project to ELMO, we get a fish that can't give up anymore. And this now uh, we interpret as the fish that Nemo is still registering behavioral failures, but astrocytes don't respond anymore to that, and the fish can't switch. And I'll show you later the kind of complete circuit interpretation. Um, this is now an activation experiment where we induced increases in calcium signaling, um, and this causes an increase in passivity um, that correlates with the amount of calcium um, in, in area ELMO. So now we can ident we've identified the integration, the, the, the physical substrate of integration as being in astrocytes. Um, we wanted to now know what's the output of this system. Um, and so we, uh, we first took inspiration from anatomy. You can see these radial astrocytes here, are some of them labeled as using dye fills in a fish that also labels GABAergic neurons um, with a fluorophore. Um, so if you stimulate astrocytes using optogenetics, um, you can trigger activity in these GABAergic neurons. And then in another transgenic fish, if you stimulate the GABAergic neurons using optogenetics, you can uh, suppress swimming. Um, and so, um, so this, is, this supports a model um, in which uh, uh, NEMO activates astrocytes and astrocytes activate or interact with these GABAergic neurons, which then suppresses swimming. And to just compare this to a study from the lab of Nelson Spruston, where they also found interactions between GABAergic neurons and astrocytes um, in, uh, in brain slices from a, from a mouse. Misha, there's um, a question. Yeah. Uh, Bhanupriya is asking, can you induce passivity even in closed loop systems by activating these astrocytes? Yeah, yeah, so that's what we did. Um, Yeah, it would. Uh, I I only showed two experiments just for the sake of time, but um, let's see. Um, oh, hang, hang on. Yeah, yeah uh, activating. So so yes, you can do it using optogenetics. Like this is this COCHR experiment. You increase passivity, um, but this experiment using capsaicin uh, and TRPV1 expression. Uh, that's that's this. This, uh, this experiment here. So this is a transgenic fish. It was a, it's a transient fish, which means the plasmid was injected and in that same generation, uh, the larvae were used for experiments. Um, only about 1% of astrocytes have this calcium channel and it's a calcium channel that's not endogenous to zebrafish. Um, zebrafish have trp one receptors, but, but the zebrafish, um, uh, version does not respond to capsaicin. So when we introduce the rat version, so this is a, a trick from David Prober's lab, um, the rat version does respond to capsaicin and opens the channel, calcium rushes into the cell. This is only about, only a very small number of astrocytes per, per fish, um, but uh, it's enough to spread act calcium activity to other astrocytes, as you see here. This is a movie on loop, so I'll stop this so you don't go crazy. Um, but you cause these undulations um, in astrocyte calcium levels. Um, and so these undulations, you can see here, this is a region of interest in, in ELMO here that we took. Um, after adding capsaicin, you 
you get these calcium undulations. You can see that uh, as these are ongoing, passivity uh, increases. So in this way, we, we did it um, chemogenetically or chemigenetically. Uh, and, and you can do the same thing with optogenetics. Um, kind of physiologically, the optogenetic approach using um, chanerodopsin is a little bit less clean because you're also, uh, uh, it's also very permeable to sodium, for example. Um, chip V1 is a little bit more selective for calcium, um, but, uh, but they both have the same effect. And also there's this other, other tool from the Dysoth lab up to alpha one AR, um, that's a, a noradrenergic receptor that's been engineered to be light sensitive. So all of these are consistent. So all of them increase passivity. All right. So so then, given these uh, findings, um, uh, we now know that these three different cell types are core to the computation. Uh, Nemo cells in the hindbrain interacting with radioastrocytes, injecting with GABAergic neurons. Um, and the information flow is as follows. Um, Norgenergic cells uh, respond to uh, behavioral failures. Radial astrocytes integrate the signal over time and then trigger increased activity in GABAergic neurons in ELMO, which then inhibit future motor output. Um, now, so, so that's basically the, the main findings of that work. Um, we also, found that in stochastic environments where, of course, in the wild, things are not always so, so clean, right? Um, you might, fish might not be in a, in a completely futile or a completely utile state um, environment. They might be in, in, in an environment where swims are kind of use, useful, but uh, not always. So we tested this in environments where some of the uh, some of the swims received feedback and others did not. And um, this is the probability of receiving feedback. So if you always re receive feedback in closed loop, uh, calcium activity, calcium levels in astrocytes remain small. Um, if you never receive feedback in open loop, they climb as you saw before. Um, and, if, and for these intermediate values, um, you get to intermediate calcium levels. These are data from, these are specifically trials where the animal didn't give up yet. But here you can see that uh, you can interpret uh, these calcium signals as a uh, accumulation of evidence that actions are futile over time. Um, so we, we're also looking at the ultrastructural level. Here's a very small piece of tissue in ELMO where you can see a GABAergic neuron in blue. Um, and a piece of an astrocyte in yellow. Um, as in mammals, they intricately uh, intertwine um, at this very fine time, uh, spatial scale. Um, and we think that this forms a, an anatomical substrate for uh, the uh, information transmission between these two cell types. We're now trying to understand at the molecular level how this works. Um, so now if we introduce this uh, energy uh, requirement, we find that there's also um, a detection of behavioral futility through area NEMO that then gets integrated in what we now interpret as a pressure to preserve energy that then inhibits swimming. And again, we were able to assign brain regions and cell types uh, to, these, uh, to these functions. But as I said before, a lot of work uh, is still needed to fully understand um, the, the, the biophysics and the network computational, uh, the, net, the computations that occur at the network level uh, to make this all possible in the brain. So um, the work that I showed you here, the, um, I can tell you what people did specifically. M. Young led the project on positional homeostasis. Um, with the help of Martin Svart, who, uh, who worked on this project initially, um, with also help from Zi Cheng Wei on the modeling, and Benjamin James for uh, data analysis. Uh, Sujata Narayan, she made uh, all the, oh, she's here twice, yeah, she deserves to be here twice. Um, she uh, 
So I made this slide last night. I was tired, so I, I copied a few people. Uh, but uh, Sujata really ma uh, made it, uh, all the fish lines we generated in the lab were generated by her. Um, and she's now uh, sadly moving to, uh, uh, she, for family reasons, she needs to go to Seattle. Um, and uh, Yumu headed the project on uh, futility induced passivity. He's now running a lab in Shanghai. Um, and he did that together with uh, Davis Bennett, uh, who was a PhD student who graduated, Mikhail Rubinov, who did all the computational work on that. And he's now running a lab at Vanderbilt. And um, we work a lot with James Fitzgerald, who is a computational and theoretical neuroscientist. So it was uh, a real privilege to work with all these people. I want to make sure that they're acknowledged and you know, if you meet them, at future conferences, uh, they are, uh, uh, they're very, would be very interesting to talk to you. Thank you so much, uh, Misha. Um, I think we are right at time. So you did very good in spite of all the interrupting questions that we asked you in the middle. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, people can raise their hands if you have questions. Um, I also put my email address here again, if anyone wants to yeah. continue the discussion, happy to talk more. That's great. Thank you, Misha. So I wish I was there in person. If, if it I wasn't know. for COVID, would this be an in-person school? Sorry? Would this all be in person if it wasn't for COVID? Yeah, exactly. I mean... If not for COVID, this would be so nice and so intense, you know, that uh, yeah, ICTS schools are always known for how deep they get into things. Um, mm. And uh, there's, there is usually a preschool uh, where we also have extensive like foundational topics. Mm. And uh, the lectures that happen at ICTS have both Blackboard as well as slide presentation. So, Lecturers mm. can go in detail with the blackboard. Um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, next cycle we can have it in real life. I hope. Yeah, if you do, I would love to come over. Absolutely, and... absolutely. Yeah. It would be a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Sanjay has raised his hand. Sanjay has a mm -hmm. question. Go ahead, Sanjay. Yeah, sorry. I, um, I heard you talk while I was walking home from work so I, I might have missed something so apologies if i have uh okay. but i had a block which is behavioral futility mm -hmm. uh, and that seemed to me like it you know it there's a lot in there in that block mm -hmm. uh of maybe higher level cognitive functions and whatnot um i, I mean i i'm not sure how you're thinking about you know how these computations uh, are are made that um, that determine whether an animal thinks something is futile or not futile. Yeah. So the uh, within within the uh, context of the assay that we used, we think of it as a very simple computation that is essentially a product of um, motor vigor, mm -hmm. which can be zero if the animal doesn't swim. And that models the fact that if the animal doesn't swim, it has no measure of behavior of futility or utility. Um, times uh, rectified uh, visual flow, uh, where uh, it's rectified so that if there's visual flow backward, um, it's zero. Mm -hmm. um, that means the animal is moving forward. Um, and when the visual flow is zero or forward, it is uh, okay. So it's not it's not it's not exactly rectified. It's like zero, jump up, and then climb up linearly. Um, when there's no visual feedback, uh, the animal stays in place, even though it's swimming, you get uh, motor vigor times, uh, say, one. Um, and then as there's uh, forward visual feedback, which means the animal's moving in the wrong direction, it increases, say, linearly. And so mm -hmm. then, uh, um, and, um, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't uh, have time to to go in into that, but you can you can see that from 
at least at the level of calcium responses in Nemo, if there's uh, visual feedback in the right direction, even if it's kind of low gain, as long as there's, as long as it's not too low or zero, uh, Nemo cells don't respond very much. Um, mm -hmm. But as soon as it gets closer to zero, uh, or the world starts moving forward when it should be moving backward relative to the fish, uh, that's when you get an increase, you get a jump followed by uh, almost a linear increase. So in, in the context of this assay, the computation should be uh, fairly, you know, if we were, we could fairly easily build a circuit model that, that would do this, right? Um, but uh, in full-fledged environments where there's vestibular feedback and proprioceptive feedback and so on, it could be that visual feedback is, is maybe uh, weak or undesirable, but, there's, but the animal still feels its body moving, it mm. still feels vestibular feedback and so on. In that case, I imagine it becomes a lot more rich when it needs to integrate all these modalities and make a decision. So. I mean, have you have you thought of sort of calculating just from the tail baits and kinematics uh, the power expenditure, and oh, to that's see a good idea. No. kind of yeah. uh, optimizing some or minimizing some some kind of a energetic parameter? That would be really interesting because uh, we don't actually know how much. Uh, how much energy is spent in these attempts, right? In this case, yeah. because it's in VR, the energy expenditure is mostly just neuronal firing, but in real yeah. environments, it's of course, mainly muscle contractions, but we haven't quantified like how, 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 how close does the animal get to depleting its, uh, its nutrients? Um, that would be a very interesting calculation. I think it's, it's probably a kind of a parallel computation. One is the brain predicting how much energy would be lost if it wouldn't stop, right? Um, yeah. When it actually energy expenditure is 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 not a is not relevant yet, but uh, you can predict that if if things aren't working out now, then probably twenty minutes from now they're still not working out, and twenty minutes from now you will be in trouble. So you'd better stop now. Yeah. Um, but I think if there are real, you know, metabolic signals from the body coming in, that that tell the brain that you're actually quite close to that point already. I imagine that that would speed up the uh, the, the giving up um, behavior even more. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking in 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 the context of many of these debates that are, that have gone on in in the field of biomechanics, where they talk about when gate transitions happen. And you know the dominant idea previously was that gate transitions happen when there's some sort of an energetic cost, you know, uh, mm -hmm. minimized. But mm -hmm. there are other data that suggest that that may not be happening. It may be just sort of a you know something that is triggered by the mechanosensory stimuli. Uh, for instance, if, you know, if the load increases beyond a certain amount, then you find that the horse trots sooner or something like that. And uh, yeah. this is entirely likely uh, even in this scenario. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, whether there is a high level computation going on about, you know, energy expended, tiredness, et cetera, or is it just like a, you know, just a sort of a, you know, mechanic some sort of a reflex loop that's uh, operating. Yeah, yeah. But so, so given given that um, that the tail isn't actually moving in these, mm. because the animal is paralyzed, and we do everything through activity in the spinal cord, I think energy expenditure will be small, at least yeah. much smaller than a fish with tail free. The fish with tail free uh, also do this behavior. They actually do it sooner. So there might. So I wonder if. Yeah, they do it sooner. So I wonder if if it does receive both inputs and integrates them. I feel that makes sense, right? An, an actual input from the, the more biomechanical input plus kind of a predictive yeah. model in the brain that says, well, for, the, for 10 seconds is unlikely to work for the next yeah. 10 minutes that these are combined. But uh, that would be very interesting to, to do that calculation because we we don't know. Um, I don't know if we can maybe we can chat some more afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Cool. So um, the second point about this is also that behavioral futility can occur over multiple time scales, right? For different behaviors, mm -hmm. um, 
for for the behavior that I mean, not just in fish, but if you think of a conserved circuit in vertebrates, uh, for us even, you know, there are some behaviors we engage in every day, or some behaviors we engage in every hour, and uh, futility can set in at any of those frequencies. How does a network like this handle uh, behaviors with different frequencies? Uh, I think, so it's a super interesting question and I completely agree. So there's some studies, there's a study by uh, Aaron Andelman from the Dysart Lab where they looked at um, a more classic um, learned helplessness assay. They used electric shocks, inescapable electric shocks and their uh, animals also became passive, but they became passive um, over longer time scales. You can also do this in, in rats. There's a, there's a study from Hailan Hu's lab um, and generally, uh, from the data I've seen in rats, uh, there's a short, shorter component and a longer component. There's, they they do perform these switching, the switching. If they're you know these tail suspension tests or forced swim tests, they kind of move. Uh, and I I think similar time scales, ten seconds or so. They pause for a while. They they start moving again. They pause, um, but then over time. The kind of the pauses become longer and the active periods become shorter and it's usually that long time scale uh, these long time scale changes that people are studying and in both rats and fish it's been found that the habenula and the interproductive nucleus and the raphe are involved in that um, and so i think there are multiple systems that detect behavioral futility on multiple time scales um, and for us, of course, right, the, the short time scale, I always think of like when you're trying to lift a very heavy box or something and can't do it, then you just, or, or probably a, other physical effort like uh, running really hard, uh, well, then you also get out of breath. So then you get the interaction between the biomechanics and just energetics. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. But um, things like lifting a box, could be, I think, fairly independent of, of how tired your muscles are. Submitting actually. manuscripts. Submitting, I would say that, that's the very, very long time scale version, right? <laughs> like two years time scale. I wish it was on the 10 second time scale. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, but things like, uh, yeah. These, the, yeah, science not working out, right? We have to have time scales of years. Yeah. Uh, we have to be able to withstand behavioral futility for years uh, if, to, be, to be a successful scientist. So uh, I think it's just layers, right? Um, where the, the longer time scale, more cognitive circuits are able to, to dominate over the shorter ones, shorter time scales time scale ones um, when needed. So I think it makes sense for this to be hierarchical or par mm -hmm. hierarchical circuitry or parallel circuitry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. This is all super interesting stuff, uh, Misha. That's that's really wonderful. Thank you so much for sparing thank your time. Thank you, uh, Vatsala. Thank you all. We've all learned this a lot. Uh, very interesting and exciting. Yeah. And I hope to have you in person here sometime when COVID Me goes too. away. I will come in a heartbeat as soon as it's safe. That's wonderful to hear. Have a good day. Bye bye. You and too. The, good night. Uh, so we meet here back again for Claire's talk at seven for the rest of you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you, Michelle.